Hello, everybody, and even if you don't have a body, I'm Layman Pascal, and you've tuned in for an installment of the author series located deep inside everyone's favorite mental heterotopia, the integral stage. Today, we're on a journey from design to design, from subject as product to subject as project, with Daniel Fraga here to help us explore and promote his new book on ontological design. Hi, Daniel. Hey, hey. (laughs) <laughs> you know, when I was reading this, part of my brain was like, I don't know if this is a philosophy of like digital Heideggerian Zen or an occult grimoire. So I, I had like Alistair Crowley in my mind and I remembered his slogan. He used, uh, we place no reliance on virgin or pigeon. Our method is science. Our aim is religion. And so in honor of your being here, I perverted that. We place our reliance in science and mythology. Our method is magic. Our aim is ontology. How's that sound? <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> and accurate. All right. Well, why don't you give us a sense of what you mean by design and what you mean by ontological? Fantastic. So at the interface of a bunch of different domains like design, philosophy, advertising, war, technology, occultism, exists what I call ontological design. In summary, it is the art and science of producing uh, changes to a being and its consciousness as part of a creative project, a deliberate project. I would also, from another point of view, we we could say that this is about designing the interfaces that allow our being to take place because our being is a process that has to happen as a verb. Um, The thing is, those interfaces can be anything, traditionally speaking or, or in the strictest sense of the design world, an interface is a screen, is a keyboard, but anything can be an interface, a pen or a chair, or even the words that we use, they are interfaces for being to take place as a happen, as a a verb. And the thing is, uh, one of the central ideas of ontological design, maybe if you take anything away from the term, uh, it, it is this, it's the idea of the feedback loop. That as we design our tools, they design us in return. As we design our worlds, our spaces, our environments, they design us in return because they frame the way that we come to pass through them. The the words that I know in the languages that I know limit my being ontologically. Not only do they limit it, but I design it. They are continuous with my post-human body. And so therefore, you know, whenever we're designing design artifacts, whenever we're designing memes, Whenever we're using advanced technologies to curate and frame perception, illusions, even when we're talking about morality and discourses, all of these things are interfaces of sorts that we can design. Therefore, ontological design is not design in the strict sense. It is an update on that term, in my view, that sees the subject as its greatest project. It's not about designing things. It's about designing people through things. So in that sense, ontological design is the science and the art of causing a change to being and its consciousness as part of a creative project. So some people, when they use the word ontological, they mean it in distinction to epistemological. And sometimes when people use it, they mean it in distinction to ontic. So when you think ontology, what are you thinking? Thinking of the impact of designing epistemology of curating phenomenology, the impact of all these different things that are in our environments, it goes beyond just, oh, well, it's, it influences us. More than influence us, it, it, it designs us ontologically. That's the deepest possible word that I could come up with to, to state the importance of, of how design frames lived experience, designs our life worlds. And that's the meaning of, of, of my use of this term. And also this, this term is not originally mine. It, 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 it was coined by Anne-Marie Willis, a design theorist from, from Australia, um, who, who is, is um, perhaps way heavier on the Heideggerian tradition of, of being and how being takes place uh, and, and through and in these interfaces that, that surround us. How did you initially get attracted to the field of design? What excited you about it? Mm. So originally I studied architecture, um, but I always felt that there was a need for me to express myself at a more intense level. I felt that the impacts of designs went deeper than the ones that are traditionally advertised in, in design and in architecture. 
um, because it simply has to cater to so many political and economical interests, right? But I was interested in how my very experience of being happens in a place, in a time that has a character, that has a shape. And the fact that it has that shape is incredibly intriguing uh, because we ourselves, our bodies, have a specific shape. So I couldn't so much be like, how do I put this? As a nihilist, looking at this shape made me realize that we have to be affirmative nihilists. In other words, if nothing means anything, why five fingers? not for why has it acquired this shape why has it come to be and to pass in this specific way and in design that led me to to look at the the way that we humans can deliberately control and intervene in our environment when we place a chair in this way we are you know this chair is in the shape of relieve me of my body weight this cup is in the shape of help me grab a bit of liquid and drink it why does man have the shape that he has? And more importantly, what does design have to say on that? Kind of rambled a little bit here. Your question was so open. So maybe that's that's interesting. Oh, no, that's fine. That's what we're here for is to get from... a sense of you. <laughs> yeah. It's also a, a, a lot of curiosity in terms of the occult causes of things. What are the occult roots of reality? Because in many ways, our perception happens in a specific shape. But who put it there? Why is this the way that it is? Why do we think the way that we think? And so I was trying to reverse engineer that, reverse engineer that which frames us and try to understand, okay, if I came to pass in this way, what if we tweak this, this, and that? Aren't we talking then about a technology of domination? Scary word, but isn't that what we are actually talking about when we talk about designing religion, designing grammars, designing chairs and pens, designing digital interfaces, the send button, the like button, the smartphone, all of these things go vastly beyond the mere framing of experience. Uh, they design humans and as such, they are a profound discipline of power. And that's why power is such a profound part of the book. Um, that's also why you could say that ontological design is, is sought and will be increasingly sought after by not only the traditional design disciplines, but also in capitalist competition, as well as in irregular warfare. Design has, for I think for a lot of people, this sense of um, strategic, rational foresight to it. I'm designing this for a purpose. But one of the things you talk about in the book is the way that every Everything that affords us new opportunities and capacities also opens us up to unintended side effects and to new dangers. And so one of the questions I thought to ask you is, like, what particular new danger enters the world with ontological design? Yeah. The ability to create the most total totalitarianism that we can even conceive of to the point of reaching some critical threshold point that we are completely lost in a new world to answer your question directly yeah. the way you framed it was so so beautiful i mean indeed this can be something to write with but it could also be a weapon or the same with the table you can put stuff on it but you could also stand underneath it for protection so too with with the technology of ontological design of framing perception uh, we can imagine that Corporations are going to design muck-realities. The perfect customer will be the product of the new industries of, of the future. Or the grammars that people use to speak and interact with their lives are going to become colonized, our psyches, uh, to the point that the totalitarianism that we're going to reach becomes increasingly, increasingly total. That midnight hour that Heidegger spoke about may dawn on us. But it is our ethical duty to think that through and not to try to regulate and stop that, but to go to it and think with it, at least think with it and see where it leads. So we're talking about some kind of reciprocal loop where we design things and the things we design design us, right? So there's a danger in that loop that it can hold itself in place and prevent change, but it's also a situation where there's two different leverage points to create change. I don't know if you would agree, but it seems like 
the kind of systems we're embedded in lean us toward imagining that we create change on the side of the individual action. Uh, because that keeps the structures that are redesigning us in place. Does that sound about right? I think what you're pointing towards is kind of this difference between the more traditionally humanist understanding of design, even of ontological design, which is I, the subject or the individual who am well financed and skilled, will employ these techniques to achieve an, ob uh, an objective of designing other people. That's one way to look at it. But the feedback loop goes both ways. So it, that's part of the reason why the last portion of my book is so lends itself so much to luck and occultism and even gaming and creativity. Why? Because whenever there's one individual affecting these ontological design interventions, they're also always opening themselves up to luck, to chance. You never know what you are going to get uh, from from a project that is based on such a volatile central uh, engine, which is the feedback loop. So yes, design research and uh, agencies and big corporations are going to utilize all the means at their disposal, and they are many, to yes. achieve good enough results on their designs to influence people's minds at scale uh, at an unprecedented rate. And but we also need to take into account that th that is mercenary theory, so to speak. But there is another kind of ontological design that is also possible, that is perhaps more creatively inspired, more connected to religion, to spiritual practice, to prayer, whatever the, des this, and this hinges heavily on the designer. And it has to do with the relationship that that designer, this is my opinion, uh, that designer, when they emerge, they can, they can give their idea of this. But I think that the quality of ontological design in the second category has to do with their ability to be creative towards death, to give a seat at the designer's table to luck, to emptiness, to uh, chaos in a way. How do you face the impossibilities of, of life? How does the real come in? We know, for example, Christianity puts the real precisely at the center of, of it, a center of the cross. It is the dead God. You worship the death of God. So that's one way to relate to it in a design of a religion. There will be others. And precisely the measure of their power will be proportional to their ability to serve as an interface for nothingness. You can make interfaces for many things, for my grocery shopping, through my phone app, for things. You can also go a little bit ahead, internet of things, spatial computing, immersive realities, fantastic technologies. But there is like this core central interface or sets of interfaces that are interfaces with nothingness, with chaos, with violence, with the other. And I have this feeling that it will be from those in that category of, of things that the great new institutions of the, this century will emerge. Somewhere between that and the kind of techno-capital markets we've had traditionally is a, a kind of blurry in-between category, right? Where you can see a lot of people who are involved in the incentives and structure of the world today going, all right, we're going to shift from designing objects to designing experiences, right? They enter this kind of ambiguous in between territory. Why isn't that shift enough? That's such a great question. I, I've had time and again, I do notice this uh, people coming close to this realization, but then skirting around the edges and never taking the full step of saying, okay, let's just design subjectivity. I feel like this is a moral and creative thing that I want to that that I want to put forth and that I don't see happening out there at all namely that beyond designing experiences you, we we need to take that step leave our humanist homeland of Kansas and and enter that place where we are able to say yes we're designing humanity we're designing humans themselves People don't do this because it's very scary to contemplate because all of a sudden you have to think about, okay, what if I have all of this power? What would I do with that? Believe me, it's not, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be too sure that I would use it for a good purpose if, you know, if I was unhinged and had no, no limits to that. Uh, but we, it also forces us to conceptualize the fact that other people will use this for their own ends. It is, it is an arms race and it takes 
this sort of moral ambiguity to be able to understand that, you know, we are in the business of designing morals as ontological designers. So how do we act morally when we know that our own moralities, which we so uh, so much we, we don't want to uh, break and trespass, when our own moralities are themselves designable and have been designed. And so you're left in this paradox and having to hold that paradox. And that's, I feel, why most people, especially in the industries, will not hold that paradox. Uh, a, because it's hard for, from a personal standpoint, so there's no incentive. B, from the industry perspective, there's even less incentive to be paradoxical and unclear and hold tension. You're supposed to give clear answers. It's got to be A, B, C, black and white, because at 5 p.m., I need to fuck off and go home to, to be with my family, because that's the important thing. So um, the ability to hold that moral ambiguity at your core I feel like it is a certain moral quality or ethical quality even of, of designers, um, which is perhaps why they are in a different category to the designers that we find today in, in, in the industry. And I'm one of them. Uh, there is there, It's like water and olive oil. There's very little space for there to be a true, a true merger. Maybe. I'm not sure. I'm just thinking out loud. What do you think? What, why do you think that there's there's this middle uh, middle category of experience designer and capitalism? Well, I definitely think you're onto something with the sort of emotional and cognitive refusal to go into nothingness, thwart, contradiction, ambiguity, things like that. Uh, on the part of all the individual designers coming together to create an intersubjective community, uh, they're going to err on the side of projected positive simple things to handle, right? And I think the notion of designing experience sounds like an exciting leap forward, but it's as far as they can go because it's as far as you can go and still be under the umbrella of we positively create things that people want and we don't have to encounter the disturbing edges. Exactly. Because it's, it's relatively traumatic to burst the edges. If we live in reality bubbles, then I would say that the techniques, skills, and tools that one ha can have access to, to burst those bubbles and to reach out of them and create other bubbles, because there's only internal sides of bubbles. The external is inaccessible. But there's the possibility to create uh, conflicting bubbles. That's what heterotopia is, is all about, really. But the techniques, the tools, and the, the preconditions to actually do that, um, they're tough. I guess. I mean, they either require incredible creativity, almost a spiritual intimation, incredible abuse can also generate that, trauma, which is probably what, what will happen from the mercenary theory side of things. It will most likely want to just imprint incredible abuse. I mean, just look at what TikTok is doing to teenagers. Mm -hmm. It's abuse. But to create new realities, there needs to be a pathic imprint. There's a reason why the occultists would draw blood and would sacrifice living beings to it um, because the, the pathos can be procured in a variety of ways, but, but it's always necessary to create reality. It's always necessary. It's never, so to speak, free. Yeah. I'm curious whether or not the writing of this book changed you as a subject. Yeah. I think, yes, it, um, not that I am a subject that is now incredibly paying attention to the spatial computing of my spaces. I'm not paying attention to that level of things. If those things were to be projected, I'll probably assemble a team and like follow an actual design process, a design methodology in that. But it has changed in, in that to write it, I, I had to sort of somehow flirt with that. I have to put myself in a, in a place where I'm trying to conceptualize that which is not there and establish some sort of relationship with that which is not there. <clears throat> That's why in the last chapters I speak about the doctrine of correspondences, synchronicities, uh, even you know examples like gambling, occultism, gematria, divination, all these things, they, they all point towards this one single central process, which is the going out or rather the opening up of the space in, in, in our reality 
where the nothingness or the question mark can say something. What that is going to be, you have to risk because you never know what's going to come out and you have to handle it. It's a little bit dangerous. But that's, I think, what I've learned the most to actually like figure out a way to somehow put myself in the path of those affects that stem from the zero and then deal with them as I must. There's a lot of talk in cognitive science about the extended mind, the idea that our, a certain set of our objects are inside our identity. When you think about this, um, the design impact of things we've designed back upon us, do you think of those things as impacting the self from outside, of there being a relationship between the self and the other? Or do you think of those things as actually being part of the self? <clears throat> They are continuous. They are, we are all in a spectrum. It depends on, on the lens of analysis. It, and depends on the utility as well. So it is useful for me to say that I am not this pen right now because it just makes sense. I'm going to a shop, I buy the pen. So at that scale, it makes sense. But at other scales, for example, at the level where you're trying to design my habits of information intake or teaching a kid how to write and read, um, then there's something to be said about the relationship between the hand and the pen and the way that the person develops their, their thinking. So that's another scale. And in that other scale, other considerations um, become pertinent. And so like, I think that in the ontological design project, there's also a great need to be precise and deliberate about the scales that we're designing for and through and with, because different things are true at different scales and relevant at different scales. So it is not the case that we can say that the same topology of concepts works at the whole scale. Even rules of coherence don't work at that level. But the basic premise, the basic heuristic rule of thumb, always, in my view, is always about the fact that there is a continuity between the subject and the apparatuses and tools and artifacts of our environments, whether they are visible like books or microphones or papers, or invisible, like words, like symbols, like social values, morals. So in that sense, it's very Deleuzian. It's very individual. The, it's, it's individual urbanism. I have at some point, I think, called it. It's basically taking all the flows of that extend between a human and, and their environment and trying to find a tenable project to organize them under the different ways of desiring that become possible now that we are able to look at these different ways of desiring and, and, and frame them, especially in the age of AI. What new desires shall this population have? How does these desires interact with each other? What interfaces are we going to put in the middle of this population to, to, to catalyze this new way of desiring? What are the, the interfaces, the, the nodes in these networks? Um, that's a fascinating possibility that is that is now emerging. How how capable or how limited do you think human beings are in predicting what the actual effects of design will be? Yeah, that's a that's a simple question. That's a, depends on the team that you have mm. and on the amount of testing you do. <laughs> so that, scarily, this is the most concrete question that I can give, which is if we assemble a proper team. We do the right exercises, uh, do the right testing. If we have the right tools to learn from the tests, then we got AI. We can have a pretty good idea almost to, I mean, not, not categorically absolute, but good enough to a very, very, very high percentage. What are you looking for in a good team member? It depends on the roles. I was actually trying to flesh this out yesterday. Um, because I feel that, that that would be the next step. So my next step is going to be to design this handbook, ontological design toolkit, where I go not only towards the, to the theoretical introduction to ontological design and what it does, which is kind of what this book is about, but then moving towards what could be a typical team? What could be a typical brief? Mm -hmm. What is a timeline? What is a client? And to bring this philosophical idea to this tangible perspective is 
it's scary and it's incredibly scary for how pragmatic and concrete I can be. Team members could could include hypothetically and depends on, on, on the brief and depends on the budget. Designers, traditional designers like UX people, service designers, business designers, but also architects and urbanists. And the category, another category would be academic subject matter experts as necessary wherever relevant in the project. So philosophers, theorists, psychologists, sociologists, artists, anthropologists. Another category would be technologists. So the people who understand technology well enough to understand that, okay, this is what you need to do in order to implement that. Strategists, people who talk to the client, who look at the project and, and ask themselves, where are we going with this? Why are we doing this? Um, obviously then content is essential. Uh, so I'm talking about yeah, script writers, narrative writers, scenographists, novelists, I mean, musicians, uh, uh, composers. And ultimately, all these different categories of team members are going to be working towards the creation of a subject as a project. Where does the idea of group ritual sit for you? So uh, ritual is, is, a, is a core tool for how humans make sense of things. It's, an inter it's a social interface that has an, an added sort of twang or, or twinge of narrative sometimes. And it serves as an interface, uh, a mythological interface for the exchange of pathos in a tenable way, right? It mediates my relationship to the other in a way that hopefully it's coherent and everybody agrees with. That uh, as an... It, in a project where the subject is the project, the ontological designer can and potentially should use ritual as a tool, but they should do that with the understanding that I'm not, it's not going to cut it to design a couple of rituals and hope that it changes the person's ontology forever. It has to be integrated under, under a broader project, a broader narrative strategy, a broader behaviorist strategy, a broader uh, uh, spiritual strategy. How does this, is this ritual something that, you know, the person is going to relate to? So there's a lot of contingencies and, and, and we need to weave ritual into the, all of the other components of the project in a, in a tenable way. But ritual is, is a powerful tool. It's another great tool right, that can be implemented in, in these, in these uh, projects. When we think about the role of pathos, it seems like it can go in two different ways, um, both socially and individually, right? We can create uh, moods, complexes, patterns, and habits uh, through the use of pathos, accessing kind of energies and perspectives and willingnesses that we wouldn't otherwise be able to get to. But at the same time, particularly inside us, there's like a range of hidden pathos. There's all the opportunity for shadow work. Right? How do we think about that, especially in terms of the systems we design in the world? Are there, is there a presence of various kinds of pathos that we're not accessing, that we would need to access in order to decompress, deconstruct, even just to understand how they're operating? That's a fantastic question. Yeah. Uh, pathos, yeah, can be procured in many ways. Uh, and if I was involved in one of these projects, what I would do is I would get like a series of, of people who are able to, like psychoanalysts, who are able to understand these indicators that may be symptoms for the, the you know, th these different kinds of pathos. And I would try to observe where they come up, how they come up typically in this person's life and lifestyle, because then we will be able to A, map, and B, make an informed choice when it comes to intervening, because uh, like you said, there's different ways to have pathos transgression is one uh, where, you know, maybe this person just needs to break some rules and we need to make this person enjoy the breaking of those rules. And we say which ones they are and we can create that relationship as this para relationship almost of, of, of antithetical co-energizement -ener or whatever. Uh, but there are other types of, of pathos. Yeah. Um, creativity, revelation, shock as per violence or blood um 
also the pathos, the, 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 the more mild and harmonious pathos, which today we kind of seem to overlook in our society, obviously, because everything is porn inflated. But I, 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 sweet joys of setting something in order uh, or drinking some tea or just enjoying some sun. I mean, these things are pr probably affects that will emerge in a more subtle way. But why not integrate them into the project? I mean, it's all, it's all up for grabs. Sunlight makes me think of elementals, you know, and the very interesting role just experiences of the so-called elements have for people psychologically and socially. Yeah. Uh, and that brings my mind to the question of where naturalness stands relative to the kind of design you're thinking of. You know, there's a lot of biomimicry people who just want to port nature's designs into human designs. There's that kind of Buckminster Fuller approach, which is if you just do the most with the least, it's going to look like some form of nature. Is there, is there a privileged status to the kinds of designs that we think of as, as natural? And how does that play into your thinking about designing uh, futures and realities and subjects? Such a cool point that you made about the elementals. It almost feels like that in the shape of man in the world, and as we do our projects, there's a few things that are the givens. Typically, five fingers in each hand are a given but also the fact that we enjoy sun when it's not too hot. That's another given, right? And other things like the water and the, the small joys of life. So those do feel like the structuring elements, the most natural elements, which is such a tricky word in nature, isn't it? Of our project. I find, I find biomimicry and, and, and the Bucky Fuller approach to design um, to be very... It was extremely hip in the 2000s and 2010s, along with, with a certain greenwashing sustainability ethos that, that still prevails in some designers. But what I think true, like the most natural thing in my room right here, right now is me. Everything else has been designed. Our, our idea of nature is usually socially constructed. So when we try to adhere to a concept of nature, are we really going back to nature? Or are we adhering to a discourse about nature? And here people might interject, oh, but I know what nature is. I know what beautiful and good and true is on myself. Then I would say, well, that has been encultured into you. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not that because it was encultured as a fiction that it is wrong. I would even say that that fiction is the most real fiction there is because it's so real. And so... What we need to do is design the next natures and, and, and to you know, graduate towards an understanding of nature, not as something that has been gifted to us and under which we live, which is to an extent true. But it's not like we can forfeit our role as steerers of the spaceship Earth, which is one of the things that Buckminster Fuller said. And as steerers, uh, ontological design comes as that as that steering, as that governance, as that ability to make the choice about where is the place of man in relation to nature and the world, and try to make that choice in the most ethical, realistic way possible. And by ethical, I mean realistic, having a clear view of the situation, not having it tinted by cultural ideas of what good is. No, no, actually investigating each project seriously because that will help us make truer designs or truer in the sense that they are more faithful to themselves and their purpose meaning my design says it does this and it does this which is something that you cannot say for a lot of ecological design today it's mostly like a marketing shtick and as such um that's how i would look at the concept of nature um real nature isn't green nature is a verb it's a nature ring. It's something that we ourselves are a part of. And I would say, just to add to that, that I would, you know, personally prioritize in terms of the tools that we have available to us to intervene and to interact with nature and all of the huge problems that nature presents to us today. I want to say, and I, I, I know, and I, this is my personal bias, so don't, don't quote me on that, but I would say that more than activism or more than 
changing the consciousness of people through the typical means that we've been used to doing that in the, in the last hundred years. That the right way to approach this problem is to figure out the new means to formulate these new problems. Project is, is for me one of them. Innovation could be one way to, to solve this conundrum. I know it's very vague, but it does represent a, a sort of mode shift. Right? That's how I see it. There are um, a number of characters who crop up in this book multiple times. Foucault, Deleuze, Robert Anton Wilson, Swedenborg's in there a bunch. What do all these people have in common? Probably many things. I'm not sure. Do you have anything in, in, in mind or is it a sort of an open it's question? It's more just a curiosity about your character, right? You obviously didn't pick them arbitrarily. You've been resonating with these people for a while. Yeah. I think with the three first and with probably others, they have this rebel rebellious attitude, not necessarily a superficial rebel rebelliousness, but one of the highest possible kind of rebellion there could be, which is rebelling against structures of meaning themselves against reality itself and opening that struggle eye to eye with it. Yeah. Uh, not from a bad place, but from a place of, of investigation and, and that, that, that good struggle. Swedenborg as well, if you if, potentially, but he's more pious. And in that sense, I'm, I also have that side of myself. He's as in Swedenborg does believe that by asking the questions to nothingness, that new meaning will emerge. And I do believe that. Is that meaning going to overwhelm me? Is it going to be correct? Is it, is it that that meaning has truths that I don't want to look at? And so probably it's not all going to be candy falling from heaven. But I feel like that's the only proper relationship to be connected, to, to be religious. What do you think people most commonly misunderstand about Foucault? I, I don't know. Um, I purposefully read him not as an activist. I think people sometimes may read Foucault as someone who is a advocate for activism, i.e. there are so many power relations in our society and so many of them are unequal, which they are. But I, if he makes this injunction, then I choose not to hear it uh, because he may, he may do it in a very sophisticated way as well. The injunction to say, okay, then let's equalize all these power relations. If there's so much inequality and if there are all these different power, power games and power relations of society, they're so intricate. And if there is inequality, some people read that as, okay, let's make all the struggle in the world to equalize that. I think that that's sort of a remnant from a Christian humanism. I think that we should read Foucault in a constructivist way. If the power relations of our society can be broken down into so many little pieces where their glaring inequality is shining us in the face, then I say, let's use that and build with them. Because this to me is, is exciting, is to see the power relations of everyday life, the social relations between humans, between technology, between design, as creative matter for projects. Uh, again, which project? The subject, reality itself. And so... Again, that's what I feel that <laughs> if in the corporate world, the experienced designers never cross that threshold of saying, let's design reality because they are just working they're sort of cogs in a machine, so to speak, as am I, then in the activist realm, then it doesn't seem to me that the, it doesn't seem like that there's this courage to actually say, uh, let's let's redesign reality then. And if there is, it's for an agenda. And in that sense, we're talking about agents. Mm -hmm. Alexander Dugan is one of them who, who literally does this game. There are many others, especially in, in perhaps the most woke movements. They read Foucault and they understand, okay, then everything is a power relationship. Let me be an activist towards this form of reconstruction. But they very clearly mandate what form of reconstruction that is. And it's usually very aligned to their political purposes. And I mean... Then I become a Machiavellianist, right? You do your thing because 
Um, that's the nature of power games. You tell the story about what truth is that most benefits you. And you will be the, the better your relationship to your own secret truth, the more powerful the story you will be able to tell. And there will be a conflict at some point between this. And that's a very intimate conflict. For a lot of people, this notion of designing reality and the kind of sense of there not being a reliable super reality behind that is very scary. How do we, um, in your mind, how does that scariness become a useful energy, a source of life, and not become a kind of nullification that haunts the world from the shadows and undermines everything? Yeah. Exactly at the moment when we see that emptiness as presence. It's weird, but the moment when we see, for example, looking around us, everywhere we look, absolutely everywhere we look, God isn't there. Because you can see him, you can point at him, it's invisible or whatever. And so that there, there, there's this relationship with absence, with an omnipresent absence. The same can be said about meaning. Behind the reality, is there any meaning? Behind, Like if we pierce this reality on a super reality? Well, no, there's, a, there's nihilism. But we can be affirmative nihilists. Or we can say that precisely the absence of meaning is extremely meaningful. Because it's so absolute. The only thing that's absolute is meaninglessness, is, is our inability to actually figure out any indicator clearly that, oh, that, that's actually the meaning of the universe. It's like between this star and that star, and there's like a book there. And like, actually, there isn't any. But the fact that there isn't any is an extremely certain fact. And if we sort of flip that back onto ourselves, then we are able to say, oh, there isn't any meaning. And that's the message of liberation. That's the message of Christianity, in my opinion. God, God, as he was being crucified, he told himself, why have you abandoned me? It's the ultimate moment of, of, it could be a horrible moment, but simultaneously in that horror, it also has a, a message of hope and of freedom, meaning uh, let us affirm our nihilism. Let us then go ahead and tell our stories from the actual crux of this whole. And these stories are not as we would like them to be, as we would wish them to be based on previous discourses, they usually have to be rested uh, in a struggling manner with from meaninglessness itself. So it's, it's not an easy task. It's, it's a very sort of spiritual divinatory task. Nietzsche kind of uh, famously wrote for a very specific audience, most of which he said didn't exist yet. And then there's a lot of problems with people reading Nietzsche and not really being the intended audience uh, because it requires a lot from you. And this, what you're describing requires a lot from people, you know, to what degree do you think people in general would be capable of the emotional and cognitive task of making that reversal uh, from absence to the presence of absence? And to what degree do you think that's going to be something that a small specific design class can do if we're lucky and that everyone else needs something else to believe in? Yeah. Even if nobody, to be realistic, probably I can't do it. Probably nobody can. Right? But we still, it's, it's still almost an ethical duty to put it out there as a possibility that there will be moments or, or ways of acting towards that if undertaken in this manner, in this specific relationship with the nothingness, can yield some sort of result. I don't believe that this is a prerogative of a specific class, even though you know I could tell that story. It would suit me. I'm the designer. I'm the leader of this whole thing. Let's do it. No, I can't even do it myself. Jesus Christ. But um, potentially it could uh, it could enlighten like a different way of thinking things right it's a, it's a pointer it's a way of desiring uh and having been you know my thing is like let's put it out in the world because if you analyze the great creations of our history of religions of all of that they all are an interface with nothingness and as we reach the era of ai and as we're able to create any in any interface that we want 
we might as well have a little method that explicitly says that, you know, inter you design the interface with nothingness, you really design reality really heavily. So be careful, but also here's loads of power. Figure it out. And I don't know how to figure it out, who will figure it out. There's probably a lot of disasters coming, but there's probably a lot of good art coming. And I you tell a real interface with nothingness from something that purports to be that, but actually acts as a final veil to prevent you from accessing nothingness. Precisely. Yeah, precisely. That's why I tell it like to say that there, to say very widely and loudly that there is a secret, but never saying what the secret is, is an interface with nothingness. Because people will look at that and they will project, their imaginations will run wild. They'll be like, oh, what is actually there? Uh, in the 1970s, well, the advertising world was sort of being born and people were, brands were trying to discover how to deal with TV and mass media. There was a gap. So brands, you know, old people, they were like seeing these young folks in London, like uh, Sir John Haggerty coming in and advising them on how to create fantastic advertising campaigns that would sell loads of their products. People would be fascinated. How can this person understand technologies, this new technology so well? We better pay him a lot of money because there, he's going to give us the golden ticket, the golden ad, the beautiful timeless ad that we will forever remember when you zig, they zag or something like that. What I think was at stake there was gap management, perception management, which is at the core of every source of mythically generated pathos. We were talking about secrets, right? So what Haggerty did was he created a veil around him an image of talent, which he certainly had, but sort of kept that gap going on as much as possible so that those from the outside of the veil would look at him and be like, what a fantastic, talented human. What a secret must they have, these Masons, these Illuminati, these insert group name here. From the inside, yeah, there's a talent, there's a skill, there's a something there, but it's not outside of the reach of the common man if you give him all the secrets, right? If you're intelligent and hardworking, that's, that's it. But the gap is the is the is the whole thing is the whole shtick, and um, that is part of, of isn't that so so omnipresent today in, in so many of our institutions today? The ability to manage that perception, to say yeah. that you can say something, is a powerful. It makes gesture. me think of a time when I was when I was a teenager. I would cut out pictures I liked and put them on cardboard and arrange them on my wall spaced out. And they would be disorienting. And as soon as I got familiar with it, I would change them. So it was disorienting again. But one that I kept for a long time was a hand-drawn ad from a magazine for the local Rosicrucian society. And it was a picture of a man's head and it said, this man knows something special. <laughs> and it's all a fiction. Cause then you meet some of these people and it's like, seriously you are the best that this secret society has to offer i think the only metric that matters is, is talent that is demonstrated and beyond that let us all understand and be a little bit cynical about the game of narrative power to understand that sometimes it is in this or that person's best interest to tell a story to manage that perception and therefore to manage their place in society that's a very DIY, traditional human way of managing power games without too much technology. Just say the right words at the right time, dress the right clothes, voila. But, but let, so, so that's a Machiavellian way to look at it, but also sort of refreshing because it just clears out the, 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 clears out the landscape. There, nobody knows anything special that you don't. If anybody claims to, they're probably trying to sell you something. And that's fine. That's their truth. Like, good for them. But let's not be too naive in there. And thirdly, let's be aware that whatever dynamic is happening here, uh, we can design with it. We can understand and play with it. We are not helpless. Mm. <laughs> My mind slid into all these when I was a teenager things. Mm. Uh, one of them was the movie snakes on a plane. And there was a rumor that Samuel L. Jackson signed on to be in this movie. And when the studio changed the name of the movie, he walked off and broke his contract because to him, the most important thing was this title. And I remember loving that title. It's 
the design value of snakes on a plane is that it tells you exactly what's going to be in this movie. As long as there are snakes on a plane, you're going to walk away happy. <laughs> and that kind of simplicity and obviousness yeah. uh, is really attractive in an age when information is so complex and so overwhelming and increasingly so unreliable. So how do we, you know, unless we just sort of design towards faux authenticity and something like that, how do we design to deal with a world in which information itself seems less and less reliable? Oh, that, that's another easy to answer question. Assemble, the, assemble a team, <laughs> name the brief very clearly and understand yep. it and question it clearly. And then you can assess whether the right strategy is to be secretive, whether the right strategy is to be simple and direct and have that value. <clears throat> it also is very important to understand what is the project? Is your project one person who's very wealthy and, and they're paying you to design the OS for their lives to really upgrade 10X uh, how, how much uh, advantage they have over the common folk? Or is your project uh, people who like McDonald's? All of them, all over the world. These are radically different projects, but the design tools that you will use to design these subjects they don't vary too much. They have to do with uh, their mental urbanism. I'm, I'm just looking here at, at some of the notes that I have. It has to do with defining their discourses and their morality. How are they going to react to a simple punchy statement versus something else? Well, we know the answer to that. Let's observe. We have the tools today. Just as long as we have the right team and, and, and have defined the problem properly, this is feasible. And this is what scares me the most. Uh, because like after this book, this is a highly philosophical theoretical book. I'm going to write a 50 pager now, which is just a handbook for how to approach this. And honestly, it's feasible. It's feasible to answer these questions as they come. And I can't wait to, to see what kinds of questions can be answered by this or asked. One of the neat theory pieces in this book is your uh, sort of noospheric stack memes apparatus meme plexus reality tunnels maybe you could quickly walk people through that here yeah of course so like in architecture usually you have different scales at which to look at designs right you can have a scale where you can analyze the door handle or where the level of the detail of how the window hits the floor that's the usually in architectural projects the most detailed kind of of drawing that you can see but you that usually is, is a really is a, in a sheet of paper that's a really zoomed in detail, constructive detail. Usually doesn't give you any information about the layout of the room, where it sits in the city. And as such, architects also usually have different scales of, of, of to show different things. You can have a, an image just of the room. You can zoom out a little bit. You can have the house. You can zoom out a little bit. You can have the urban setting. You can zoom out. You can see the whole city or the country or the geography. Same with memes, same with ideas, and same with ontological designs. At the crux, at the atomic level, at the most specific, at the level of the constructive detail, there are memes, right? The basic unit of informational exchange. But um, not only memes as, a, as, as, a, as this virtual thing that is in our heads connecting our ideas like words, but also uh, devices as memes, right? which is a little twist that I do there at some point. But beyond that, there's the level of the meme, which is at the bottom, at the most zoomed in level of the scale. If you zoom out a little bit, you have the apparatus. What is an apparatus? It's something that connects a lot of memes and the flows that emerge between memes. Um, it's a thing that precludes a way of interacting with it and thereby um, it organizes memes in a specific way. It has the property of channeling flows. The apparatus here was completely taken by, from, from Agenben and Foucault. So whenever you see someone using a phone, smoking a cigarette, going onto the internet or using a pen, that's an apparatus. That's an apparatus because it, because it is mediating how they interface with the world. If you zoom out a little bit more from that, if you put all of the apparatuses that I have access to in my life or you or someone else, that's a reality tunnel. Meaning everything that one person is given to perceive phenomenologically, their life world, all the apparatuses, that's their reality tunnel. <clears throat> So it's basically a networked way of desiring because if one apparatus precludes a specific way of desiring, like this pen makes me want to write in, a, in one way that I've become used to and I've learned to like, and if you take all of them together uh, 
And that's my network of desiring. That's how I am. That's my personality, which as I say in the book is nothing more than a compulsive habit. That we, it's a habit of personality. It's how we talk. It's the way that we're used to desiring more than anything else. <clears throat> And then we, need, we take the jump outside of ourselves, right? We take many reality tunnels, which are impossibly infinite, right? The, the, the abyss of the other. I don't know you. You don't know me at this inner core level. We cannot, can we ever know anybody at that level? But if you stack everybody's reality tunnels together, you can create a meme plex, a culture, a cult, a group of people that are habituated to emote in a particular way. Maybe they share the same apparatuses. Maybe they like the same football club. Maybe they like the same bands. Maybe they have the same sexual uh, proclivities. Any way that that tends to happen, the cultural differences, any way that that emerges, we can be talking about a meme plex, the sharing of memes, of apparatuses, and a certain affinity between reality tunnels. Bear in mind that each of us can be a part of many meme plexes simultaneously, many reality tunnels, or rather many configurations of the same reality tunnel simultaneously. So it's not like I'm part of one team or another. No, you're part of all the teams all at once. That's how it works today. And then what happens after that, if you take the set of all possible meme plexes that organize all the humans and all the societies, if you take all the nation states and religions, if you take all little groups of friends, which by the way, constitute a meme plex as well, as well as schools and teams, well, you have the newosphere, the maximum possible level at this of this mimetic scale, which is the... The sphere of mind. It's what comes after the geosphere in our planet. So the, at our planet, historically, there was the geosphere. We were a hot rock floating around space for loads of loads of years. Eventually, the biosphere emerged. Life emerged. Air, oxygen, plants. They changed the composition of the planet. Something new emerged. A new quality of, of, of thing appeared. From that biosphere, humans appeared. And now we're creating things of mind, things of technology. Uh, and... Teilhard de Chardin was, 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 was big on this idea of the new sphere, of this sphere of mind that is having an impact on the planet. Even though it's short-lived and it's very fast, it is having an immense impact on the planet. It is causing the Anthropocene to take place. Uh, and this new sphere, the way that I conceive of it, is more like a climate that is volatilizing. It's warming. Symbolically and technically, climate change is a thing. It's correct. Meaning that, indeed, the climate of the mind of humanity is accelerating. And that is the level at which we need to look at where everything on the stack sits. All the mean plexes are in the newosphere. So it could be the case that there's a hurricane at the newosphere, to, to make a really crude example, that seeps down into your reality tunnel very quickly because it's all connected and to the apparatuses. Or it could be that there's a new apparatus in town or a new way to articulate memes, look at the smartphone, that has impacts that go straight up into the newosphere. So this is a heuristics. This is sort of a a way to understand a little bit the different scales at which we can talk about these things. Super useful if you're going to be actually designing. Super useful to clean up and, and sort out the ideas that, that we're talking about. But they, they are also very permeable between themselves. It's not like there's a place where one begins and the other ends. No, there's continuous processes. There's loads of, and these are the interesting ones, uh, edge cases at the transition between these layers. How do you think about those transitions and interfaces? Like, um, I know that's somewhat heuristic, but do you have a general sense of how things move between those layers, how they influence, you know, what kind of leverage they can exert over each other? I think it's the other way around. Things move chaotically all around. Yeah. This, this, this stack is more like, okay, let's try to like map them as yeah. they come to us on these categories because it's just a little bit more useful. Um, because it's just, a, it's, it's more like a transition in how, in our lenses, in our understanding of the world, not in the world itself. Um, and so in that sense, it, it doesn't seem to me like, it depends on how we, and <laughs> to be really crude about it, the transition is very much dependent on how in or out you want to zoom into things. So it depends on your project. What do you want to see? Seeing is a creative action. Uh, my categorization here was a heuristics precisely because of that, because it means that it is by no means a categorical definition of the great measure of man. Um, it's just a pattern, a way through which reality patterns itself and displays itself to me as I see it. And it, I, I built it in a way so as to be as practical and useful as possible. So if you had an individual 
which is to say a reality tunnel or a community of reality tunnels. And they found themselves constantly subjected to a certain kind of noospheric memeplex hurricane was afflicting them. Um, how would you advise them? How would they go about negotiating or making their world better if they were constantly subject to the attack from a larger scale? Ah, oh, yeah, of course. So imagine these, the, these people live in a river, but that river is, is, is the water is just coming in. It doesn't stop because there's a hurricane. So I would teach them gr the great art of creating dams and, and taking that energy and try to use it for their own advantage. Technique is all we got. Like, how, do, how else are we supposed to navigate the world? So I would say, let's figure out, let's figure out like, what are the apparatuses in this reality tunnel? It seems to me like the brief, as you're describing it to me is, is a defensive brief. It's also like, there's probably some cultural things connecting these people. So, so we can investigate those. So off the cuff, I'd say that what we're going to do is to try to figure out what are the, the interfaces or the apparatuses through which these new, new spheric pressures come into these mean plexes and reality tunnels, try to like figure out those valves, try to like characterize, switch around, play a little bit with those valves. Um, Curate the information that goes in, that gets consumed. That's pretty much the fundamental bit. And then try to implement some, some habits of like interpretation vis-a-vis -vis these torrents of the newosphere. That's what I would say off the cuff. Obviously, this merits some investigation. Sure, sure. But it's all about it's all about like managing flows. One of the interesting things that comes up in the book for me is the possibility of new spaces in the noosphere that haven't been explored or colonized yet. Uh, what, is, what, did, what does that make you think of? Where does your mind go on that? It makes me think of like some of the, like, at the, you know, everybody's got that, mo has had that moment when they have gone to their own edges and have been given to perceive some things that are, exciting intimations of beauty like oh this 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 is probably what artists the great ones also are very good at mediating with right the great artists are really good at taking that and like bringing it down here and i'm hoping and i'm thinking that as the you know the great talent of humanity comes face to face with with technology but maybe with the human being itself as art Right, because that's the whole thing about the ontological design, the ontological art. We are using ontology. Reality itself is the artwork. And as all of these artists, like every generation, we have so much talent coming, coming in, uh, address this using these new technologies, ways of thinking and designing, which we are bound to encounter in the next ten years as AI matures. Then we'll 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 find new spaces that are so different to what we've been used to. I'm sure they're going to be wildly different. Like it would be the same as dropping a Stone Age guy right here, right now in modern Europe or something. Uh, and I think that we're going to see that very soon, very, like, very accelerated, right? Phenomenology itself can be in a way solved technically and therefore curated artistically. To even conceive of this is to risk, to risk a little bit of madness because it's like, oh, wow. So everything that I've known, that I've felt, that I've learned to inhabit can be switched, changed. <laughs> the consequence of this is most certainly not going to just be one or two generations of kids with ADHD from social media. It's going to be monstrous. It's going to be bigger than the agricultural revolution, I feel. And it's coming in the next like decades that's that's my impression. And so new spaces literally means unknown spaces. And part of me is always going to say unknown could be cool. So there most certainly is going to be many artists threading those limits. It's certainly beautiful in art and music and personal experience when you come across what seems like a whole new genre of experience. Right. When you hear someone who like a band that cornered their own new region of sound, it's amazing. It doesn't even matter if you like them or not. You're just like, wow, nobody else ever made those kind of noises before. That's neat. Yeah. And, and the affects that that produces on you, because you are the canvas for that music yeah. as, as a listener. It's not only about the music, but about what it makes you feel. 
all the things that I'm feeling that I was not even aware of five minutes ago. Uh, and yeah, the, the feedback the, loop as the media. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the possibility of this accelerating and the role that technology plays in that is interesting, right? People talk about, can we automate scientific discovery, right? So there's a similar question. Could we automate the discovery of new regions of the noosphere? Off the cuff, I'd say it kind of still hinges on humans. I think the bottleneck is humans because we're the ones picking stuff for each other. We're picking new logical berries for, to give to each other because we think the other people will like it. So, uh, yeah, I don't think that because human sensibility has this core of unknowability. We don't really know our motivations. We can map them externally and really predict them. But isn't that going to change how the motivation reacts in this new environment? So that's that's the trick. That's the transition from creativity to mercenary theory. Mercenary, mercenary theory, it's like factory farmed uh, number one billboard hits, the, the likes of which we have today plentifully. But that's the mercenary bit of it. And that's not so interesting. In the interesting side of things, I still think that will require the good old human talent and the artistic uh, sensibility to, to, to somehow curate and be at the crux of this magnificent new ship. The thing is, the artists that emerge are going to have tools like never nobody's ever had before. I hope that's the case. Um, it's very, it's an interesting unknown problem, how close the mercenary approach can actually get to simulating the creative approach over time, given new yeah. tools. Yeah. I mean, we, we have that nowadays. Um, so many of the billboard hits are simulations yes. of what people are typically going to like, aren't they? Yeah. And could get, I mean, what if that got 10,000 times better, right? This oh, is what I wonder about myself is what I would do if there was a system that I knew was artificial, but at the push of a button, it would give me a new song with novel content in a style that I already like, <laughs> but different enough from every other song in that style I've heard before. Would I switch from human music to this system? I might. <laughs> yeah, domination at scale. It's going to happen. Now imagine embedding this into, into like, because what you're zooming into is this one incredibly powerful vector for domination to take place in in this in, the, in one reality tunnel totally right and it will happen at scale i imagine people strategically steering these things at the level of the new sphere with their new scopes and figuring it out because then what we're pointing towards what we're figuring out i think right now is a moment where again phenomenology is going to do a it's going to completely implode and change into something else. Because if you can, if you can addict at scale, at will, it doesn't look like addiction. People love it. Like, what are we creating here, right? Uh, we've never had this type of power before. If anything, there was some people who were super smart and literate and had a little bit more food, and everybody else was like serfs. That was the best case scenario. And like, if civilization is built on that gap. And so you want the few can rule the many, whatever. But what this does to politics, what this does to war, what this does to humanity is it's, it's obscene what it can do. And the only response that I can imagine for it is a handbook. Exactly. Yeah, that's uh, I think it's important for people to understand that about this book. It's not like you're proposing there's a good old fashioned reality and we should leap from that into this uh, affirmative nihilistic relativistic nightmare where we design our own realities you're proposing that that is already the case. It's going to be more the case going forward. And this is our minimum option for being participants in that world is to start hacking ourselves. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a defense discipline in many ways. So how does the Swedenborgian art of correspondences play into this? What does it open up for us in the noosphere and how does it help us approach 21st century ontological design because it's a heuristics for how to relate to that which does not make sense there's a lot of that out there how might you how might we relate to things that do not make sense in a way that might be useful for us without getting drowned in pareidolia and apophenia without going too psychotic or schizophrenic 
but also retaining some of the pathos and vitality that is so necessary for us to sustain our own realities because we cannot LARP uh, to be spiritual, right? Many people try, but you can't LARP at it. You can't fake it. Swedenborg's doctrine of correspondences to me uh, is a little bit that, is a bit an example of a methodical approach to extract meaning that is incredibly valuable uh, and able to sustain a prolonged system of belief in a way that can be steered by the one ontological designer. Uh, and that that's, that's the place from which creativity towards death emerges, creativity towards absence. We could also say it like that. And that's the only creativity that I feel can be a little bit of a bulwark against factory farmed mercenary uh, content, which is coming. So imagine you are in a metaverse stuck forever in a loop of content that is targeted specifically for you. And it's just going to completely, um, you know, be there to, to cater to all of your desires. Almost, almost sounds like I'm talking about the unconscious, right? How to talk to it, how to establish a conversation with the unconscious. Well, you do that doctrine of correspondences. You try to figure out meaning in this way, in this creative way. Because the thing is, we do not, even phenomenologically, we could go full Truman show with this and ask ourselves, is the unconscious that different from the coming totalitarian takeover of reality by AI? More importantly, what are we doing to improve our capacity to have a conversation with it? And how can that conversation fuel realities that we believe to be good for ourselves, our little corners, our little homes, our little families, groups? I think that's the important question. Yeah, it seems like there's a real need, and a lot of people are sensing this lately, uh, to return to some version of a shamanic or magical paradigm where we have some kind of practice or at least the idea that we're negotiating with unseen things that we may not be able to understand and that we may have to fight them. We may be able to create them. We might be able to summon them. We may have to ward them off. We may just have to dialogue with them, but that kind of notion that that's the world seems to be coming back in a big way. Most well, certainly. Uh, yeah, that's, sort of a, a grammar or heuristics that I also talk about in the book through which we can read the events of everyday life as if the images that invade us in our phones every day, aren't they ghosts as well? Aren't they demons and spirits as well? Yes, but we need to be pragmatic here. And the only thing we have is technique. They, are function they, they can be functional demons, functional ghosts. Uh, they just need to be networked properly. And the ability to network cannot be left to the to those who know, to the priests or to the, to the experts. Uh, I say that for myself, which is why I am, I'm so adamant about, about approaching these projects in a, in a way, because if it, if it is true that one of these projects can attain its, its purposes by design, by single, assembling a team, by getting this, this toolkit on, in place and implementing this, this research. And if it's true that, can interact with this then what we're doing is indistinguishable from magic but also from religion but also from design but also from creativity and technology uh and to me it not and from war and to me it inaugurates like this really different way of thinking about the world like for me that's going to be the moment where the vessel is broken unleash the ghosts and then it's like mode two humanism is gone how are you approaching the problem of uh, designing but writing this 50 page handbook you're talking about because it sounds to me like it's got to be plausible for people who are in the design industry but it's also got to read like a handbook for magicians if you want to read it that way it's it's super simple i feel like it, it's gonna be way more simple than than this one because it's so it's industry standard there's an industry standard in the innovation uh, uh, agencies and creative agencies about how to approach projects about experience design or um, conversation design, which is what I do uh, for Alexa and Siri and stuff like that. And there are ways typified, cat cataloged uh, for how to approach a project, especially service design and business design are the 
the best ones because they really are about going in and discovering the problem that you don't know exists yet even. So it's a methodology for discovering things. It's faster than science. It's not as specific as science and not, not so concrete and, and validated, but it's faster and you can figure it out on the go. That's why it's so valuable in tech and, and, and these new industries. And so it's, it's a simple method. Uh, and, you know, if the voca if vocabulary one doesn't suit X person, then we'll change it because it's not about the vocabulary, but about the functions. Um, and the way that I'm approaching the, the writing of this uh, handbook is, like I said, then very, very, very um, straightforward, concrete, like step one, step two, step three, step four. First step, discover. Second step, interrogate. Third step, design the solution. Fourth step, build it. Fifth step, test it. Under each of these categories, there's loads of exercise you can do. Customer interviews, customer shadowing, the typical stuff like Design 101. The thing is, you can look at different things as you're designing. And that's, I guess, the key thing that I want to bring to it with ontological design. Mm, do you think about setting up designs in ways that will be robust against the attempt of other systems to um, recapture those designs? I know that there's this term from some of the tech communities, I like to bring it up all the time, counter anti-disintermediation. The guys who thought they were setting up disintermediation technologies ran into the problem of active forces trying to anti-disintermediate by hmm. reassembling that technology back into a new platform of control and domination. So what yeah. they realized was they had a good plan for a new system, but that system's always going to get absorbed by something. So what they really need was a plan to thwart the absorption of their new thing, whatever yeah. it was that they designed. It's a great question. I mean, like I've, I've, I've never been one that, I mean, I'm a consultant, right? I'm not a startup person or a systems designer because I've, I'm more psychotic than neurotic. <laughs> no, because it's more about figuring out um, ways of working rather than figuring out the perfect product. Indeed, you create a system and then obviously that creates ripple effects on the landscape and other people will create other systems. That's going to change the landscape. So your system is, is going to be in a different landscape and, and two moves. So how to react to that? That's the chessboard of geopolitics today. That's the chessboard of, of tech and capitalist competition today. Um, my, my view is, is more like a student of, of the dynamics here, more Clausewitz than Napoleon. I run into groups and communities that are uh, uncertain about the kinds of interactions to have when they set up groups and organizations, right? Should we be, do we just assemble the right technical people and run a good program for this? Or do we have to be having and presencing different parts of ourselves having a different tempo of conversation within the organization, that kind of thing. Maybe, for, maybe we didn't take enough time to share our feelings or that sort of stuff. How do we, how do you think about you know, that kind of duality? It depends on, on what the organization is, what the people are, who they are. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but what I would do is basically you know, try to try to suss out what really is at stake here, like interview all of them understand the organization its requirements its budget its its intentions i know this is very corporate speak but it's just the speak that i know how to speak and it's actually just the precise way to reach a problem that we don't know the solution to yet meaning just ask a lot of questions to figure out the appropriateness of the design to the end are what are the functions being fulfilled here are these people like what are the dynamics happening between these people what does each of them say they want are there any commonalities? Can we work towards that, etc. So, it's it's it would be an effort of unpacking it, I would sure. say. And usually, like in my experience, what happens is obviously because no, nobody's got a budget or time to actually do a design research sprint on everyday situations like this. But usually, what happens is that we're all amateur ontological designers. I am. Everybody is, because we're trying to figure out how it works in our lives. Without, have, without really doing like the actual research or, or, or investigating it more concretely, we kind of wing it and see what happens. So yeah, that's sort of how I see this. What is EnviroCell 
And uh, what kind of issues do you think it raises? So Envirocell is this company um, that was around in the 90s. I think they're around today. They were focused on consumer research around retail spaces. So they would basically, they were very intelligent about this. They would basically go into retail spaces, observe people, basically customer shadowing, and then characterize the, a specific person's route across the retail space along a variety of parameters, which is industry secret. They don't say what those parameters are. But basically, based on that, they were able to analyze a bunch of people, analyze the recording from the video cameras, etc., and come up with recommendations to the client to increase how they would sell. Things like move the tie rack from this place to that place is going to increase tie sales for 20%. Or put the snacks on, um, on a different shelf because kids want the snacks and kids can't reach the high shelf. So if you put the snacks on the low shelf, the kids are going to grab it because that's what we've observed. And so they did it. Now, again, they were first comers to the market. They came up with these things. As they attained this advantage as part of the capitalist arms race, other people were like, wait a minute, we got to get out, get in on this. We can't be left behind. So they did that. So again, we have an arms race. When you add digital technology to that, when you add uh, big data, we start to find phenomena like Cambridge Analytica, which is not different from what Viracell did. They basically told political campaigns what, where the eyeballs of people are going in the great retail supermarket that is the internet and what type of interventions you get to make because we got the data, we've observed it and we've, we've thought about it. And so you're able to produce recommendations that are valuable uh, in the end. This obviously hinges a lot on the quality of the designers and how, 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 how well equipped they are and how up to speed they are. But that's what Envirocell did. And they were basically the, they were one of the first players to come in. They were not the first, obviously, but they were a clear example, at least, right? Of coming in and using consumer research, studying people obsessively, gather the details, and somehow ontologically design them for, in, that, in their case, profit, in the case of Cambridge Analytica, votes, in the case of the future, who knows? Maybe everything at once. Reading through the book, it's clear that um, morality and ethics plays a large part of your thinking around design. And of course, because of the strange risk that's involved in the idea of designing realities and designing selves, uh, you do try to make a point that you're approaching this <laughs> from a moral ethical standpoint, because otherwise that risk seems very scary to people and, you know, might be something demonic. Uh, but I was intrigued by that. I know you're sort of, you're teasing apart morality and ethics in a kind of uh, Deleuzian Spinozanist way. It's a little bit different than the way I tease apart those things. It seems like you're leaning a little bit towards right, your, your personal ethics versus the morality that's required of you by the world. And when I was thinking about that, I thought, well, I think about it a little bit more like ethics is the, an insight into what an ethos or an environment demands of you. And morality is a little bit more like morale, which is to say it's the capacity to enact your values against struggle. And then, uh, well, you could put those on a grid, right? Because obviously you want a, a personal and an external and an insight and a capacity option when it comes to morality and ethics. Yeah. Uh, so there's a similarity and a difference. I just wanted to say that, you know, I think separating out morality and ethics one way or another is the minimum step in order to start thinking about this more clearly. Yeah. Uh, but aside from my ramble, <laughs> you know, what's the... Uh, um, I just want to touch in on how important it seems to you to presence morality and ethics in this text. That's a great, like you, you made me think of something that I think I've, I've thought before um, on, a, on a great point. So like in the, in, in one of the last chapters, the last chapter is really like where I suss out the ethics and the morals. Um, basically just re reinforcing points that I've said previously throughout the book, which, which are peppered through. And so at the end is kind of like this, uh, that's how I end it because it's uh, so important to, to this research because there's so many conundrums it's so scary at times because what is good when good can when design can design good scary thing and you made me think about this there's this external morality the discourse of society which is that which uh, in many ways i try to design and rebel against and try to criticize 
versus an internal ethics. That's my axis. So this internal ethics of the designer. Am I being a designer that is ethical or am I being just a yes man to the Stalins of my time? But you spoke about, and this is extremely pertinent and completely true, an external ethics. What's the ethos that this space requires of me? Football team. If, if I, I can't just attack, I need to run back to defend when it's time to defend. I can let just the other guys do it. There's a thing that's expected of me. And then an internal morality, which is perhaps similar, but more at the realm of, of, of the values and of the stories that I truly believe in, because we all have a few that we really believe in. It's, it's impossible to escape this. So thank you for helping me, because you've added this extra dimension of, of external versus internal and switching it around. So it certainly does influence and help my thinking. Um, but yeah, to, to go back to your original questions, uh, morality and ethics are super important in my book. I try to separate them. I see morality as the stories and discourses that society uses to cohere and ethics as a faithfulness to one's own desire. What that means for an ontological designer is that uh, are you ontologically designing or not? That's the question. That's the ethical question. To do that, Ethically, for example, you need to have a clear view of a situation. You cannot design based on hunches. You need to research. You also cannot be just a yes man for the discourses of your time. To be ethical, sometimes you need to question the discourses of your time. Break some rules sometimes. Maybe not, but you need to be willing to do that. You also need to be willing ethically to contemplate dystopia as a thought exercise. Otherwise, you're just leaving it. You're just a sitting duck for whoever is able to conceptualize it first. And then they're going to tell you what good really is. And then you're screwed. So, so we might as well think through the, the dark elements of this without um, the initial reflex of naivete and innocence because the internet has really disrupted the geopolitical but also moral order of the last 70 years. And it's, it's time we, I mean, we've got to think about it a little bit at least. What's the best place for people to get their grubby little hands on this masterpiece? Do they just go to Amazon or is there some better spot? How do they get a it? Amazon? It's the one place where it's being sold uh, with my, uh, because of my ethical uh, lack of concern for the great perils of capitalism. Of course, Amazon is where I'm going to sell it. So yeah, it's, it's a li the link can be found on Amazon. You can also read a little bit more information about the book on www.fraga.space. Here it is. Um, hope you like it. <laughs>